Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to Cooper Studios and thanks for watching Brick Filming Fridays. Uh, I didn't put a Brick Filming Friday out last week. It was Thanksgiving and I had too much wine and turkey, so I fell asleep on Thursday. But here we're going to make up for it. Today I'm going to try to explain how I make objects fly. This seems to be the most requested tutorial and uh, I hope to explain it in very basic terms because there are multiple ways to do this and there are different um, ways to go about it. So here's how I do it. So uh, first I'm going to show you the following clip is a clip from Pacific Brick. Now, as you see there, I, I make two of the fist objects fly here. This fist and this fist is pretty cool and a lot of fun to do. Now, um, the way I do it is I'm going to show you exactly right now. This is the first picture I take. So I set up the model and I, I take this picture. As you can see, both of these things have supports coming out of the bottom of them, right? So we need to erase these supports. Now, if I just went in here with an eraser from the, you know, like a basic paint, Microsoft Paint program here, it would just all appear white, you know, and you'd have to go and, you know, physically draw in the blank space. So you can't do that. So in movie making and animation, you have to shoot a plate, which is basically everything in the, the shot that 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 you can replace any support so exa for example the next sh shot i take is the exact same picture i don't move the camera i i just move the objects with the supports out of the way and then i take a a, a new picture so base essentially these two pictures are exactly the same except for the presence of the object and then I continue this process every time so in the next frame I move the camera a little bit I take a picture with the object remove the objects and then uh, you know now we have the background and the entire animation is done this way it's not the easiest this probably would be much easier with blue screen technology or perhaps digitally putting the fists in there but I like to do everything in the camera and you can do this way too. I, I think it's the most straightforward way to, to make objects fly in stop motion animation. Um, so now what we have to do is we have to fix this because if you'll see here, I go back to the animation screen here. Um, it's gonna be slightly out of focus because it doesn't give you a preview of the focus, but look what's happening. Now when I play back the entire animation, it looks like a flip book. And I, excuse me if that, uh, you know, if you have, you know, hope that doesn't give you epilepsy or anything, but this uh, this is what it looks like played back at normal speed. You're getting the main image with a composite image, the plate. This is always going to be called the plate images. So what do we have to do? So now I have to go into After Effects or some other program and separate these two frames so we have two movie files. All right, so now we are here with the same clips basically i've taken each individual picture and exported them as an image sequence and what that gives you see there in the top left corner you open up the folder and it's just every single picture individually put in a folder that's what an image sequence is an image sequence there you go so once i've got all these individual pictures i've put them into final cut pro this is an older version of final cut pro as you can see right here and this is what i'm using so what i will do is I will take all of the pictures and I'll just take the whole folder and drag them. See how they, they appear all in the timeline at once? We're going to plop it down right there. Okay, so what it's done here is it's placed each picture individually on the timeline. Let me zoom in and you can see each picture here. Now what I've done is I've um, gone into my preferences in the editing tab for my user preferences what I've done is you see the still freeze duration right here I have made it so that each individual picture only lasts for I guess this would be 0.2 or 02 seconds and that's what makes it so when I drag a picture down here into the timeline it only appears for one two frames that's it two frames because I shoot doubles now what do we have here we have the same problem we had in the last, uh, in Dragon Frame, 
we get a flickering effect because what it's doing is it's playing it all back. So what we have to do is separate manually, and there's probably some great automated way to do this that I don't know how of yet, but um, the only way I've figured this out is you separate manually the pictures. Now, what the, what's very important is that the the ones with, with the uh, supports goes on top, and the frame here, the plate that has nothing inside of it, has to go directly underneath it. So we'll place it like this. So the, these are lined up perfectly. And basically, we have to continue to do this for every single picture. I say we like it's like it's me and more people, but it's me. I'm doing this all by myself, all of this individually like this. So I would go through and, you know, it's a painstaking pain in the butt process because there might be a better way to do it, but that I don't know. But this is how how I do it. And so you end up with two um, animation cycles. See, that's the very beginning of the animation there. And all now we have just this, right? And underneath it here, we can turn off this video layer. It might have to render. But now we have the exact same frames of video, but there are no objects. And that's what we need. We need a plate, a moving video plate. So what I would do is I would put an in frame and an out frame. We're just using a small example. I would usually do all of the pictures in and out frame, and then you export each video file, video track separately. So this, I would go up to here and file export as QuickTime Movie, or I'd use Compressor, and I'd save it as a movie. And what you'd get is just a, a, the basic, the entire movie without the supports. And then I'd turn back on the top layer, and then I would export this side now I would turn it on see and so now we have the other video and I would export this. okay so I've zoomed in on the screen here to give you a look at what these look like these are the two movie files completely exported and separately as QuickTime files let's play it with the supports this is what it really looks like oh, it's a little choppy this is a little bit of an older computer needs some RAM but the idea is the same what it's doing is it's playing back the movie just with supports you see same exact thing this is the actual animation and over here underneath we have the same exact motion but without it's like they're missing it's like they're gone and uh, this is what we need we need this plate and so what we need to do here is somehow bring this in front of the plate like this and this is actually a, a brilliant explanation of what what exactly is going on here no matter what program you use no matter if it's after effects or, or, or some form of avid or you put it into final cut pro or, or movie maker it doesn't matter what we're what i'm trying to get across to you is the concept of how you make the supports erased because for the longest time when i was a younger i didn't understand how this was done until fiddling around i figured it out you need to somehow place this over the plate and erase this part or rather you need to cut out this part wherever your your plate is so that behind it the plate fills in the holes and what's that called that's called masking all right so this is an older version of after effects it might be familiar to you okay now what i've done is i've imported the both files we have this one like I said before, this has the uh, supports, and this one doesn't. What we're going to do is we're going to put the one with the supports on top because we need to see this. This is the top layer. If you think of it like a sandwich, this is going to be the very top part of the sandwich. Underneath it over here, we need to put the plate. See how this? I've named it plate. We put it here directly underneath. Now, we still can't see the plate because... The top part of the sandwich is covering it. See this? We can't see anything underneath it. But what we need to do is somehow cover up these, these things. Or rather, what we're really doing is cutting a hole in the top layer of the sandwich and so that we can see the bottom layer of the sandwich, which is, you know, the plate. So what we have to do is I'm going to apply a plate. I'm going to go layer, mask, 
new mask. This is a mask. All it is is just a point, a bunch of points that show you where you are going to cut a hole in this layer. Now what I do is I manually, see what's doing? See how, see how I can make the entire top layer disappear and, and what it's showing, this is the back plate, this is the bottom layer here, and what's over here is the top layer, you can see it. So what we wanna do before this, this is having the opposite effect of what we want. I have to invert the mask. Inverted. See this little checkpoint, that's nifty. So now I wanna highlight these mask points, and I'm gonna drag them down here, ta-da! And what I do, is I drag them over the supports so that you don't see the supports any longer. There's one. There you go. And if I click out of here and you don't see it, there you go. For this frame, I've eliminated this, this support because underneath what you, you're, you're really getting is you're cutting out this hole and you're revealing the layer underneath it. And so what I would do is I'd either add points to this thing and do the exact same thing over here to this side, or I could add a whole nother, a whole nother mask, but that would be complicating things. What I like to do here is I go to um, the tools. So what I would do is I'd use the tools over here to add vertexes or vertexes. See, and I just click along the mask. And what I can do is out here, out here what I would do is I would just drag them. This is kind of a silly way to be doing this, but but it works. What I could do is put one there and see, extend this mask all the way up. Ah, see what's happening? I need to add another, I should have used these, but I'll just add another one. Here, I'll add two. And what will happen is I can move the mask like this. And what I've done is I've basically eliminated the, the, the supports for this frame. And anything else that's happening, uh, all you do is just you, do, you go to the next frame. Now, what happens? Oops, that just moves it to the right. What happens when I go to the next frame? Now, that's, that's, that's good. It's still working. The mask is still in place here because it's just being applied to this top layer here, see? But watch, because this is a moving shot, once the camera has moved far enough away, the mask is interfering. You see, it's still in the exact same position. And now it's starting to block out the shot and now it looks bad. What needs to happen is from the very first time, this is why we use keyframes. See mask path over here on the bottom left? This is the little time stopwatch. It's the, it's the, um, the keyframe thing. We click that and that sets a keyframe. It's like planting a flag in the ground. It's saying this is where the position of this mask of all these points is going to be at this time in the timeline. Even if you move it here, it might be at a different point, but that's what a keyframe is if, uh, if you want to understand what that is. Or that, that's how I kind of put it in my mind. And what we do here is, you know, I just, I'll have to fix this a little bit. like that. Okay, so that is the first frame and we have keyframed it. Now what I will do is I will go to the next frame. I'll just inch along the timeline. Now, oops, all this stuff moved. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag it. Now see what it's done? It's created a keyframe for me already because it realizes that the position of these dots is different from the position of these dots slightly. So it's gonna move it for me. That's the beauty of the computer. It can do this complicated, minute um, movements for you. So we're gonna move to the next one. And you know, I would you click the keyframe and you adjust the keyframes again. And you continue to do this for each frame until you have the entire thing done, which I'll show you right now. I have the, the file. Okay, so here's the original project that I used in the completion of this effect shot. See what I've done? Now, every one of these is a keyframe. Now, if you're, I doubt you're watching this if you're an experienced animator or special effects person, but most people today use a motion tracker tool, which is where you take like a target and you fix it on a point, like something shiny, like it could be 
uh, the end right here, this point is very different from this. And what do you do? You press a button and it tracks this stuff for you and creates the keyframes. But with stop motion, it's a little bit different because you can see that even though I go for as smooth motion as possible, the the movement is a little bit jerky sometimes. Like we're dealing with very small minute. Plus I like doing it manually. So it gives it a human touch to the entire situation. So this is what you end up with. You end up with a timeline full of keyframes, full of these, but what, what they really are, it's the exact same thing. We're moving it, we can move it out of the way, we can manipulate it, and that's all we're doing. We're cutting a hole in the top layer and making space for the bottom layer. Now what you do, once you do something like this, you export it as one singular movie file instead of two separate movie files. So we, we would hit file, export, or no, add to render Q. You would do this, and then you'd, you'd, you'd set what settings you want, and you know, what do you want, it's HD or lossless or RGB, all this crazy stuff. You know, look it up what this means if you're not familiar. And um, uh, and then you out. So we are back now in Final Cut, and this is the project file for Pacific Rim. And what I would do, and what I did do, is I would import the file that I just created in After Effects. Basically, it's right here. I mean, not Rockets Fired, I'm sorry. It's Fist Fly Final. That's what I named it. I would take this from up here and I would put it down in the timeline and there you have it. That is how you create it and you, you end up with something that's fairly uh, fantastic here. I don't know if you can see it or hear it, but it's a little choppy, but basically he fires the rockets and he takes down the monster and that is how this is created. This is how I create flying scenes in all of my movies since, man, since I since I started. This is the process I've been using. Now there are different ways to make objects fly. There are all kinds of different effects and way. No way one way is right, but this is usually how stop motion uh, animators do their work. So I hope that was easily explained. I, I tried my best because I know all of you who are watching right now are at different skill levels, and I, uh, I hope I explained it better. Let me know if the, in the comments if this was helpful. Please like, share, and sub, uh, you know, share the video, and subscribe to me on uh, uh, Cooper Studios on YouTube. I'm on Twitter, at Cooper's, Facebook.com slash Cooper Studios. And I'm on Instagram and all the other stuff. Just look for Cooper Studios. So thank you for watching, everybody. It's a late night for me. I am going to bed. Enjoy. Bye-bye. Uh, Cooper Studios. <laughs>